Welcome to the Crazy Wisdom Podcast. My guest today is Kip Mock. He is building at Valor Atomics. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Stuart. I really appreciate it. Yeah, this is going to be a very, very interesting uh, episode. Uh, I've done a few episodes on nuclear power. I've done one on fusion, uh, and uh, but it's kind of been very spar sparingly throughout the years. Uh, but you sent me this wonderful document about uh, how what you guys' crazy plan to create oil out of or synthetic uh, hydrocarbons out of nuclear energy. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's the 10 second elevator pitch is synthetic fuels instead of electricity as the, as the end product of nuclear power. Yeah. And then, and then uh, uh, the, and I met, I got from the document that essentially it is so that you can plug in to our system, which is already built for hydrocarbons. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, hydrocarbons are already the way that we move energy around the world. Um, it's diesel, kerosene, and gasoline are uh, transportable in the existing infrastructure, tanker ships, pipelines, um, to to a crazy degree that is uh, like unimaginable if you're trying to move that much energy via electrical wires. Um, and mm -hmm. so it's a it's a completely different market than electricity. It's a rapidly and cheaply distributable commodity, right? And so, yeah, that's that's the primary reasoning behind going that route. Very so. cool. And so, what does it take to actually um, uh, to so you, we've got this big nuclear power plant, uh, and because it doesn't have to be connected to the electrical grid. Uh, how does it actually create, how do you create synthetic hydrocarbons? Yeah. So one of the really key factors of what we're doing at Valor is that rather than, you know, normally, um, all synthetic fuel today is made with electricity. Yeah. Um, uh, it's actually a lot easier to do it that way. Uh, um, because your, your inputs are, are water and carbon dioxide, um, you need hydrogen and carbon, right? So you you split hydrogen from oxygen in the water, generally speaking, using electrolysis, right? Which is a very simple electrical process. What we're doing is changing that process from an electrical process to a, a thermal thermochemical process. Uh, and the importance there is that rather than spending energy and losing efficiency by generating electricity, and then using that electricity to generate hydrogen that then goes into the synthesis process, we're doing it completely thermochemically. That, that makes the engineering a little bit harder because water splitting thermally happens naturally at 2200 degrees C, uh -huh. um, which is, is lower than even a high temp nuclear reactor, right? So in order to make it happen, um, we have to catalyze the reaction and bring it down to around the 750 degrees C mark. Um, and apologies, let, I'm, I'm trying to keep this like balance simplicity as well as like answer the question fully. Yeah, so, yeah. well, no, and this is great because that's that's what I what I what I'm an expert at is basically um, because I'm I am not an expert in this in this subject. I only I'm very, very interested and curious in it. And so I have a lot of follow up questions about that. Uh, so there's. You're, so it's really, I, I interviewed a founder yesterday who's into green green hydrogen green um, uh, which I believe is what you just mentioned which which is the using the electrical grid to create hydrogen fuel um, exactly yeah. yeah and then what you're doing is you're taking a nuclear power plant uh, and then creating the fuel and you said that uh, because the nuclear reactor is so hot, there's something that needs to happen. You need to catalyze the reaction. Is that an accurate? Yeah. Well, so what I meant to, what I meant to communicate is that, um, if you want to pull hydrogen out of water with heat, which yeah. is heat is the energy output of a nuclear reactor. Um, you need to, you need to figure out a way to bring the temperature that the water splitting happens down to the output temperature of the nuclear reactor from, from 2200 C, which is the water splitting temp yeah. down to about 750 C, which oh, is okay. what, our, what our output temp will be. Yeah, and so, it. yeah, in order to do that, we're using the sulfur iodine cycle, which uh -huh. is a, a pretty well-established 
form of catalyzing uh, hydrogen water split uh, water splitting um, thermochemically. So, uh -huh. okay, okay, that's very interesting. So you've got this. And this is what I love about startups as well, and I lo what I love about the the wild future that we could potentially live in and the past is just this there's all these things that are there that people are studying and what it feels like the job of the entrepreneur is to identify which one of those are feasible and then just throw them against the wall to understand what's actually possible and then hitting the right. eureka moment whereas like a scientist is hitting the eureka moment on a completely different thing which is they're just throwing a, they're just they're trying to create theory and practice together and find out if something's possible just generally possible, theoretically possible. And then the entrepreneur basically comes in and tries to figure out, okay, well, how can we actually make this practical by turning it into a business? Um, what, what's your take on that? Oh yeah, no, that, that's a fantastic question. Um, this is uh, this was all Isaiah. Um, he's been thinking about the problem of nuclear energy for almost a decade now. And uh, his grandpa worked on the Manhattan Project. So it's always just been like top of mind for him. And the fact that nuclear energy, you know, 50, 60 years ago, we were told nuclear energy is going to be too cheap to meter, right? There's, there's that famous quote. And that's not been the case. Um, nuclear power plants have been outlandishly expensive. And so Isaiah tried to figure out why. Um, and ultimately, his first conclusion, one of his first conclusions was that uh, nuclear reactors are the wrong product to sell for a nuclear company, right? And the reason for that being, if you're trying to sell a nuclear reactor, you're entering into a two, three decade long sales cycle. Yeah. And, and uh, enduring a lot of different legal burdens, as well as practical and execution burdens that you don't encounter if you're vertically integrating the reactors into your product stream. So that was the first realization. And so the first key tenant of Valor is we don't sell our reactors, we own and operate them and we sell a product. Think about it similar to how Elon uh, yeah. with SpaceX decided that, never mind, we're not gonna sell rockets to NASA, we're gonna sell kilograms to or orbit, right? <sighs> um, he, he took the principle of space, space flight and realized that the product was wrong for the incentives to line up for rockets to actually become cheaper. And turns out he was right. He's made rockets 25 times cheaper um, based on that simple product shift. And so that was, the, that was the second question that Isaiah had to figure out is what is the product that Valor can sell that's uh -huh. similar to that paradigm shift that Elon made at SpaceX? Um, and there, there are other entrepreneurs um, Hate to, I mean, well, never mind. I love to give Elon cred where he deserves it. He, uh, what, what a guy. Um, <laughs> so, uh, one of Isaiah's first thoughts were things like ammonia, um, or or just hydrogen itself. Hydrogen is incredibly energy dense by mass, um, but then it's not energy dense by volume. Right, very hard to transport it. It likes leaking out of everything. And so Isaiah, Isaiah's eureka moment was mm -hmm. realizing as he was thinking through, okay, what do I combine hydrogen with in order to make it both energy dense by mass and by volume? And he had this, uh, it's carbon moment, right? <laughs> That's, we already figured this out. We, we know that it's hydrocarbons. And so um, it, it, was, it was that moment where he realized, wait, we just have to, build a lot of nuclear reactors, use the heat to synthesize fuel. And there we, we have a product. We have a product and we have a $4 trillion terminal market. And so that was that was Isaiah's, uh, you know, years of thought uh, came down to what ultimately is a, is a simple, simple solution that you can explain in, you know, five, 10 minutes. But that's the that's the vision and that's kind of the, um, the, the, those are the core reasons behind what we're doing and why, why we've taken this kind of unique path um, in terms of all the other nuclear startups. So, 
Yeah. And there's, there, it, it's, and I would love to talk with you about Microsoft if you want to talk about it, uh, because Microsoft, I was, I was, uh, is, is, it's just like a fascinating example because they're a giant company and that company now needs uh, a lot of power to run its AI uh, chips. And, yeah. you know, people have been talking about Bitcoin in, in similar when, when Bitcoin was a little bit more, you know, who knows what's going on with Bitcoin right now, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but, you know, the, the same, it was the same thing that Bitcoin is going to create a nuclear renaissance, uh, because it's essentially like you, you, you it, it just can be the Bitcoin mining can be right next to the nuclear power. And now <laughs> AI again has taken over all the cryptocurrency, uh, hype and, and all the power that was going into the Bitcoin mining and, and, uh, and then it is now, um, trying to do the same thing. And this document they give me is so interesting because that document uh, goes into why it's so difficult to build a nuclear power plant in the United States. Uh, yeah. And there is, it, it's the same reason that it's now difficult to build a house in, in the United States or Canada uh, that essentially like you've got one third of the price of the house uh, now just like dominated by this regulatory craziness. Uh, and so the same thing, nuclear power, I guess there's an argument to be made that it makes a little bit more sense with nuclear power because, you know, it's, it's not just a house. It's like this thing that could blow up. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so then you got Microsoft who has now decided that energy is so important to their data centers and their AI plans that they need to build nuclear power themselves. Uh, which is really interesting. Can you talk more about what your idea on, on that is? What's your take on that? Yeah, so I think that the power demand of data centers is still uh, a little bit uncertain. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's seen yeah, those yeah, charts of like a, a hockey stick in er energy demand purely from data centers. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that we have to consider the likelihood that uh, efficiency gains in uh, GPUs will yes. be exponential. I suspect yep. they will. Yep. And to be perfectly honest, you know, uh, LLMs are cool, but I would rather see a lot of energy used to reshore manufacturing to the U.S., Ooh. make transportation cheaper and faster, um, and do like cool stuff that really, really matters. And, and LLMs, sure, they can, they can do a lot of things that are really useful for humanity. So I'm a big fan. Um, but uh, there, there certainly is the possibility of uh, co-locating data centers with uh, existing or new nuclear power plants. And I think that's a great idea because there's no reason for them to be uh, co-located with population centers, um, other than, you know, there's an existing grid there. So you'd think it would make sense and there's existing internet, but these are not huge monumental costs to run, uh, run internet lines out into the desert <laughs> next to a nuclear power plant. Right. So I think it's a fantastic idea. I, I think that a lot of nuclear companies are going to have success pursuing that as their core target market. And I, I hope that it allows um, some of these advanced reactors um, other than Valors to, to get off the ground. For us, it's it's a side play uh, rather than the main show. Yeah. Um, and so I, I do anticipate that down the road, we'll have various data centers um, that are very power hungry, co-located with our sites. Ooh. And we will eventually oh, generate power for them as well. Um, but it's, it's not the core mission and it's not the, um, it, it's not the bulk of our projected, projected revenue goal. So, yeah, it's, it's really interesting and it takes a lot of, uh, sort of, uh, ability to disconnect from the, the traditional ways that we see power and we see energy. Uh, I'd like to talk about the, the grid itself as the as a beginner not knowing too much about the grid uh uh and the reason why you just kind of talked about a little bit well let's go to the data centers the data centers you know the idea is, is that microsoft's going to put it out in the desert and then connect put it put a nuclear power plant next to the in the desert and then put the data centers right next to it uh uh so that they can gain power in this efficient always on way solar doesn't do that 
uh, coal can do that, um, uh, but it's not ideal. And then, so that's one way to think about it. But do you actually, do you know, I can check this up too, is uh, what, what, what percentage of the electrical grid in the United States is for data, for data centers? That's a that's a great question. I don't know yeah. that off the top of my head. Um, yeah, it, it obviously has spiked <laughs> over the last yeah. couple of years, um, and it's more than you'd think. But I, I don't know precisely. Let me let me check right now. And of course, Google is uh, data centers. According to Reuters, in twenty twenty four, data centers could use nine percent of U.S. electricity by twenty thirty. Uh, okay. And so let me see if they any follow up. Oh no, they did a ad blocker. Uh, okay, so that's maybe it's like three to four percent or something like that. So that's data centers, and 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 I loved what you said about efficiency in terms of the GPUs and like whether that like whether that will rise. And it makes sense too because this is the only computing revolution in my understanding of history where efficiency is no longer important basically like or according to the hype of today that its efficiency is like no longer important it's just like spend 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 let's get these things trained uh what what do you what's your take on that sounds like you have something interesting to say yeah that's that, that is a really interesting question i have uh some pretty shallow thoughts so uh, i'm i'm sure i i, I could be corrected here but I, my gut tells me that, um, similar to the, similar to, you know, search when, when search was starting to explode, um, you know, the, the initial big winners in search, uh, are, are nothing today. Um, they, they, they were not Google, Google yeah. Came, yeah. came in later and Google came in and they put together search on a shoestring budget um, by today's standards. And, you know, what did XAI just raise? Like six, almost $7 billion, right? Wow. Um, on, on a, I can't remember the valuation exactly, but on like a 17, $18 billion pre-money. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that the, the valuations and the projected terminal markets are, um, likely likely inflated unless and until somebody one of the players figures out how to make this product actually function more than a really really nice chat chat bot <laughs> uh, because we've already we've already seen the value peak you know people pay 20 bucks a month for for chat gpt or for anthropic or for perplexity but um, and you'll get a few hundred million people who will pay that. That's a great market. Sure. But yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not, yeah, 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 yeah. It does not really justify the amount of influx of capital that if that's the only market, so that there needs to be some other market that these companies break into, create, uh, innovate towards before all of these valuations become justified. Yeah. And if, it might only be one of them. It might be a couple of them. They find different markets, but um, it a lot of these companies are going to go under and a couple of them are going to go to the moon for sure. Um, I don't know who they'll be um, or why, but um, it's definitely it's definitely a fun hype cycle to watch for <laughs> yeah. sure. Yeah. And, and you're, you're outside of it. I've been inside of it, uh, which has been very interesting. I'm no longer inside of it, which allows me to get to to see there's a lot of truth in what you just said too like and 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 we're i like the i, I we're going to go back to nuclear power cuz it's so interesting it's got so many other questions but it makes me think about a another philosophical point about this whole ai stuff you mentioned that there's a lack of a product and it that is 100% true it's being enabled inside of these organizations in the same way that so it's going to change all the organizations but not in a clear product way it feels like not yet right like yeah, there, there, yeah. there could be products ways, but it's really human augmentation. So like everything I've seen about this technology from the insider realm is that it augments humans like those 200 million people who found them their way into chat GPT. And now that number stopped. And so like, that's right. the, that's the amount of people that are, that are able to use this technology to augment themselves. 
Uh, right. And that's the product, but it's not a product you can sell, and like except for human resources, right? Yeah, I mean, you're so right. And I think probably the best example of this is Apple's foray into AI, Ooh, um, right? So rather than Apple, instead of introducing their own chatbot product, they just sprinkled uh, LLM enabled features throughout every single aspect of their OS. And now it's just something you get for free when you buy a new iPhone. Yeah, 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 and yeah. so it's... Yeah. Uh, the level of technology that we have so far, other than the subscription service to to various chatbots that can scrape the web and synthesize info for you, they're really fantastic. I use them all the time. Yeah, uh, we're we're already getting to the point where the primary value add of AI to date is now just something that gets thrown in with a hardware product uh, and a software product mm -hmm. that you're paying for. And you're paying the same price as you did a year ago, but you're getting all of this, all of this additional functionality. So I guess that's kind of the, the key example in my mind of uh, all of these companies, uh, if they want to, if they want to justify their valuations, they need to come up with a, a real product um, because otherwise it's just going to get commoditized and shoved in with uh, all of these existing hardware, software um, products and that's fantastic for all of us because we're going to get MacBooks, iPhones, laptops, whatever, that are a, a huge step function, easier to use and, and more functional for us. But you're right. Yeah. It's, it's hu human augmentation and it's not a product. It's just a, it's a combined feature set. Yeah. Um, so. And it, it, that, and that's why I'm so, that's what part of the reason why I'm interviewing you as well is because once the AI came into the picture, it feels like the perfect bow tie on the personal computing revolution the in the 1960s 1970s 1980s like it feels like the perfect sort of like okay well, that's it that's all you get uh you know <laughs> like 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 uh now you got to figure it out and then and then the things that are now becoming much more interesting to me are deep tech hard tech and energy like energy is so fundamental for the way that we we as a civilization like i i, I, I a couple of years ago i read this great book by this scientist an energy scientist who just goes through the entire history of energy maybe you you know him but like uh, it just goes through step by step. W w how exactly? What are the energy f sources that humans have used? You know, for most of the most of it was dung. Most of it was dried dung. That was how most humans had yeah. had been getting their energy was dried dung, <laughs> like like whether wow. a human or or cattle. Uh, and like that that was it until coal was found in 1830s or 1820s in 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 England or peat. Uh, and then all of a sudden that just sh sh set off this industrial revolution, uh, yeah. which has like there's this great meme uh, uh that uh, it's the guy in the corner watching people dancing um uh and the, you know the, and and it's the they don't know meme and it says uh they don't know that there was already a period of automation that led to a meaning crisis like uh you know like a lot the conspiracy theorists could take it as like okay or not conspiracy theorists the atlanteans could take it as like Atl atlantis that existed before there was like crazy robots and such like that but it's really referring to the period of 1830s to 1930s where life was totally fundamentally shifted in these crazy ways that we're still like, we're still trying to, to understand. And this is where sure. nuclear power comes in. Cause it was like, that was the whole science fiction of the 1950s and 1960s was like, this is going to change our lives in these really abundant ways. And then it failed to happen. And, it, 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 and, I want to go study the history, but I want to I want to I want to dial in uh, more about Valor as well. Um, so, synthetic carbons. Who uh, do you guys like? Where are you guys in the business? Uh, where is it right now? What are your next steps? What are your obstacles? Who are you? What are the milestones you guys are looking to hit? Yeah. Um, well, the history is so fascinating. Yeah. I would love. I mean, to we can go into it. We can go into it. If you I, want. I could, we could spend hours talking about that, but I'll answer your question. Um, <laughs> um, so, so right now we're, we're pretty early. The company is a year old. Um, we, we have, uh, we're, we're entering, uh, probably about midway through our seed seed round. Uh, we've only raised one round so far. Um, so we're in a fundraise at the moment. We've, we've built out our team. Um, and, our next big milestone, we have have two, um, are building and testing our thermal prototype. So a non-nuclear prototype here in our uh, office in California. Um, 
And that's effectively to take our, our reactor design, run it through its paces without actually having special nuclear material um, splitting atoms uh, and, and adding that level of level of risk um, to validate that our design works. There are no, no problematic components or, or failure points. Um, so that is, is on track for close to the end of this year. Um, we also are in tandem developing our fuel synthesis uh, process engineering. So similarly, um, in, in a few months, I think we've got 92 days left on our on our timer, um, maybe 91, I'll have to check, um, is our, our first prototype of uh, stream generation of synthetic fuel using the specific process that we know will work, will work with our um, production reactor. Um, zooming out a little bit here, we're not, at Valor, we're not reinventing the wheel on any particular technical detail. Um, while we are working with a large number of difficult engineering problems, mm -hmm. we are, uh, to your point, earlier on in the conversation, we're taking a lot of things that have been done individually um, and they're difficult things to do. And then we're just combining them all into one. So we know all of them work. We just have to get them all to work together economically without fail, right? Yeah. And so combining the sulfur iodine process with Fischer-Tropsch, which is the, uh, the combination of hydrogen and carbon into uh, various hydrocarbon chains, um, so uh, namely, you know, methane, gasoline, butane, uh, kerosene. Oh. Uh, and then then effectively, we just refine it like a traditional refinery from that point on. But uh, we have to get all of that stuff working. So those are our next two milestones. Um, after that, we have a, a really short lead time to our first fission test. Um, so our, our, our first reactor that will actually be undergoing nuclear fission. Um, will be, uh, follows that very rapidly. And then uh, longer down the road, we have a development path uh, to get to our production candidate um, within within about three years. Mm. And then, then we have to solve the manufacturing problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, that's that's so interesting. There was a question I had about, so yeah, butane, methane, um, kerosene, uh, uh, like, do you, are you guys going to be able to make all of those? Why would, or, or is one going to work better than the other? Um, uh, it, it feels like kerosene, it makes the most sense. Cause if we can get nuclear powered j jets, then, then that's like, it feels like game over. Like that's the jets in future. Um, what do you think? True. Yes. Yeah. No, you're, you're, you, you put the nail right on the head. Um, our, our catalyst of choice um, has been shown to bias towards kerosene. Uh, um, so about 40% of the output, um, will be, will be jet fuel. Um, so all of the other hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon, uh, everything else on the spectrum will be there in varying percentages. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers. Um, and it, it does vary a little bit here and there, depending on really minor changes to the system, but yes, we're targeting jet fuel as our primary output. Um, it's one of the more difficult hydrocarbon chains to make um, synthetically, and there's a, a huge demand for it um, coming down the line from, from different regulatory bodies. For example, I think mm -hmm. uh, there's a really short lead time to the point where any flights out of Singapore are going to have to be fueled with Whoa. synthetic fuel. Holy shit. Uh, I, and I think that's like less than six years away. And nobody else has any viable sight line to actually making that feasible. Um, and and we do, so. That's really interesting because I did a, a recent uh, podcast guest. I'm not sure I can publish it, but, uh, but it was very interesting about synthetic fuels, synthetic jet fuels. And the, the main claim in that one was that uh, uh, there are various processes for, but it feels like to me that there's a lot of snake oil in, the, in this, in this uh, general world of, of, mm -hmm. of, uh, because we have so much government money, like you said, Singapore 
demanding yeah. that that their their jets are going to work this way uh, uh and so many many strings attached and many many opportunities for that thing that we discussed earlier which is the 30 percent of a home being paid in, right. in in canada for for you know like administration administration of of uh, doing that home which like they didn't play a part they just took the time instead of uh instead of except for you know the argument could be made that they're, they're the government so they've set up the situation to allow for this to happen but it definitely feels like uh, not that way uh and so uh so yeah there's there there's a lot of snake oil it feels like uh in this in this general realm um mm. and uh what do you think do you think there is like like it's so hard to like in modernity there's just so it's it's so complex we live in such a multifaceted world where there's so many things going on you know back in plato's day or or marcus aurelius's day you could kind of you know, understand the system, uh, uh, kind of maybe, maybe couldn't even understand the system back then. Um, but now it's just so complex. There's so, it's almost so decentralized. Uh, but it, like, but it, 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 it's beyond the ability for us to understand what's going on. And there are all these points for like seed oils or, um, you know, microplastics in the water or all these other things that, that are just, opportunities that are rife for creating things that are marketed as these things that will help us but in reality are actually taking us back what's your take on that giant question i just asked yeah so let me give you a, a fun example about snake oil yeah. um so i live in california yeah. uh and california has uh, pretty stringent requirements for what percentage of energy is from clean sources. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, it's actually not, not viable for them to pull those requirements off. What they figured out was they can just buy some energy from uh, Nevada. It may or may not have been generated <laughs> by a gas power plant, <laughs> but because the carbon wasn't emitted in, in California, the state of California it counts by the letter of the law towards the the green energy yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. the, the emissions didn't happen in California, didn't see it, doesn't exist, right? So uh, I know that's kind of like a, a disparate example, but you're, you're right. There are just so many, uh, there's a lot of misdirection. There's yeah. a lot of confusion. Yeah. And I think it, it, it is important to cut through the bullshit and understand that uh the purpose of valor atomics is to make energy cheaper mm. that that's it like there's there's mm -hmm. nothing else that that matters um we're not our our existence doesn't depend on synth uh saf being mandated by various airports around the world it doesn't it doesn't depend on any government money any government decree um the the question of whether or not Valor Atomics will succeed is exclusively, can we make diesel and jet fuel for the same, for, for, for less money than it costs to drill, refine it uh, uh, from traditional, uh, traditional means? If the answer is yes, we can do it for cheaper, there you go. Valor yeah, Atomics has yeah, accomplished yeah, yeah. its mission. We've yeah. made energy cheaper. Um, that being said, you know, I, I mentioned Singapore because it gives us it gives us a, a oh, an yeah. easier off taker contract potentially yeah um but it is not it is not crucial for us and uh we would we would not be in a good position if if we did depend on on that kind of thing because all those types of things are always fickle um the yeah. crux of the matter is can valor atomics make energy cheaper yes or no we've got to answer that question we have to answer it fast um, and that's what we intend to do. So, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. And it's the, the energy being cheaper is so simple and it's, that's the thing about companies and it's the strange place about where we're living right now in the, in whatever's going on right now. And I'm reminded that I'm in Argentina and Argentina is rapidly dismantling a lot of the things that we're talking about here. Um, mm -hmm. the, but there's some core questions about Malay as well as to like it, it, it's it, it's the wrong battle for him to try to go and and argue with the United States about um jet fuel emissions or 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 what type of jet fuel they're using in the airplanes and 
in in Argentina, it makes much more sense to domestically uh, change things in terms of their own governmental picture. But the issue is, is that it's in a global system. And so there are some questions as to whether like whether it just becomes more dominated by the system that the United States is setting up, which is the at least from the national government, the United States is is very much like a not not what I understand the U U.S. government's role to be. Um, and so that's a, that's an interesting point. Uh, and so. OK, so and I would like to we got we got about 15 minutes left. Uh, there's uh, there's El Segundo, where I know you're in California and you're in El Segundo, which is uh, an interesting thing is there surfing are there are the are all the people who are getting together i should uh, set this question up a little bit better the the there are uh el segundo some of my listeners probably know this but el segundo is turning into a hot spot for uh deep tech and hard tech probably having a lot to do with the rockets their traditional aerospace that in the 19 uh, 1950s and 1960s in the in los angeles uh but it's right next to the beach are 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 there are is there surfing going on among the founders of these companies um everybody's too busy working <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh maybe occasionally there are a couple guys i can think of who surf yeah, yeah but um we don't have time for for many hobbies here in el segundo uh -huh. uh, and our most of our hobbies have to do with work so yeah, yeah, yeah interesting uh so I would push back a little bit on it because because business development there 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 is work that gets done and that can only get done inside of an office. But then the, the crazy thing about being human beings and connected to this sort of distributed cognition that we have is that a lot of work is actually like uh, going and grabbing beers or going to surfing and and participating in activities. Um, yeah. Uh, so so there is there is that. And I'm asking this personally, it's, and it's funny because I, I've my I found that my actual uh, expertise for the last 15 years is doing exactly that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, uh, took the founder of my last company to come play polo uh, uh, in in Buenos Aires, Argentina, which was a, a hilarious uh, experience. I'll, I'll save that story for later. If anybody's curious about that story, I can I can share it in DMs. But it's pretty funny. Um, but there is this this hidden layer of of business. Um, that is, is, is interesting. It's like the perfect example is the offsite is the, is the company oh, offsite yeah. where everybody gets together and does not work. Uh, sometimes it depends on the offsite, but, uh, um, but it just focuses on meeting people and, and establishing the relationship, which is really funny. We can talk yes. about that if you want, or we can go drill down into exactly what's happening in El Segundo right now. Well, I, I will just say, uh, I do agree with you. Um, and I don't think, we don't need to argue about that because I don't think we have a difference of opinion. Yeah. Uh, I'd be happy to drill into into the gundo and yeah. what's going on. <laughs> yeah. So what's going on? Why? Like what? What? Why? What happened? Why? Why is El Segundo becoming this place where people are going to? Is it? Is it an alternative to Silicon Valley? Like what's going on there? Yeah. Um, man. So I've been here for seven months. I I moved from Idaho at the beginning of this year, uh, beginning of twenty twenty four. Um, and it's been a, it's been a wild ride. Um, I couldn't, I, I wish I could put my finger on it. Um, but I think the, probably the most, the, the clearest way in our, I can articulate what's going on is there is something powerful, mm. um, and meaningful, mm. um, that is attractive to people about a bunch of people coming together in a random place, um, a town of 16,000 people in the middle of LA County, um, building and solving the world's hardest problems. And, and I think it, it, it probably is just, it's as simple as that. Uh, and then, you know, in order to get that message out, people like Augustus and Isaiah, uh, post stuff on Twitter <laughs> and people think it's cool. <laughs> and so, um, and it is, it is, it is cool. It's, fun. It is, it's, 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 it's so yeah. And, it, it, and it's re literally, I'm looking at the map right now. It's literally the right next to Los Angeles international airport. Um, yes. and there are, there are a bunch of beaches and it looks like the traditional LA, um, sort of neighborhood thing. Uh, it looks like there is a park is the, is the El Segundo parks and recreation. Is that a nice park? Um, I've been to a couple parks in, in El Segundo. 
I actually have not been to that, that one in particular. One. Yeah, My yeah. wife and kids have though, and, and they like it. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, and so, okay. So, and so there's a bunch of people working on some hardest problems. What is, what is the craziest thing that you've heard of people working on, uh, in El Segundo? Um, have you, have you like, well, do, oh. is there a place where people are meeting? So like, is there, is there like, what is the scene? Uh, uh, is there like, is, are there investment funds who are centered there now? Um, you know, I don't know. There, there are a lot of, uh, there's so many VC firms in the area. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's anybody who's primarily located in El Segundo, but there yeah, are definitely all a lot of LA of... too. It's not just El Segundo. It's also the entire metropolitan area of Los Angeles. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, every Friday we, we all get together and have a massive bonfire on the beach and it's a great time. Um, but it, it, uh, Man, your question about what's the craziest thing being built here. Um, that's a, I don't know if I can answer that. Um, yeah. they're, everybody's doing something crazy in a different way. Are there drones? Uh, yeah, yeah. There, there are a couple drone companies. Um, there are, uh, there's uh, metal work. There's manufacturing. There's Ooh. software integration with, uh, hardware platforms, there's, um, weather control. Um, yeah. there are a couple nuclear companies actually in El Segundo proper. Uh, Radiant is, is the other one here in El Segundo. Um, so it, it it's honestly just mind boggling that, you know, such a high concentration of, uh, deep tech companies are in, in a five square mile chunk of land. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it sounds it, like there's a scene. It sounds like there's the scene going on, which is so interesting because we can take this back to the personal computing industry, which is that um, the only reason that Silicon Valley is called Silicon Valley, or one of the only reasons, is that uh, Aero, uh, there is a huge. Uh, so it was what's his name, uh, Shockley, William Shockley, uh, inv inventor of the semiconductor. Uh, did a lot of his work at Bell Labs, I believe, uh, and please correct me if anybody's listening to this, get this wrong, uh, but uh, Bell Labs in New York did a lot of his thing, found out how to do this semiconductor with this doping thing that allowed the the transistor to put electricity through this wire in the in the particular way. And then he comes out to, I, I think it was his first employer in Pasadena, uh, who then, um, and there was a big question of whether he lives in Pasadena and starts this new company where they produce these semiconductors, or he goes in closer to his mother in Palo Alto. Uh, and he decided to go closer to his mother in Palo Alto and, uh, and then, and then starts this company. Um, and wow. so, and, and like that's in the 1950s, I believe. So he starts his first company there and then, and then slowly, then he has the treacherous people, or they call—I forget. There's some word, the treacherous seven, or something like that. He was a horrible manager, like like brilliant, brilliant guy. He was trying to test people on their IQs, and was just like a very, very disagreeable person uh, uh, who didn't know how to manage people. And so the there was a revolt, and so then people who were working for him go and start Intel, um, and uh, and then and then there's that goes down, and that's how Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley, but. You know, ever since that point, there was kind of like this scene developing where where him and these other people who revolted him and went to the other companies like that. That was, you know, they all went to these places and they all went to the, you know, the, the and then it goes through transitions and it feels like Silicon Valley, while interesting and 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 will continue to develop a lot of things like there's a shift here. And what, what you just described in El Segundo uh, feels like it's a um, a new scene that's developing and, and specifically around these really, really hard problems, which Silicon Valley doesn't really s solve anymore. Like there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot in AI there going on and, the, and there's the fancy uh, conference called Cerebral Valley and, and, you know, there's, there's interesting things going on, but it's so focused on software. Um, whereas these hard problems are, are kind of remaining there in the distance. And, and, you know, all of that is open to debate and question if there, if there was uh, any disagreement there and such, but, um, uh, but it's exciting. I, I'm, I really, I want to go check out El Segundo and, and, and go surfing there. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, 
I, I think you're absolutely right. There, there is a, a long history of people doing crazy stuff in El Segundo. Yeah. Um, okay. We're moving offices here in a couple months and we're moving into a, a warehouse that I can't remember which company uh, used to operate there, but there's a, there's a gantry crane um, where they used to hung, hang fighter jets from oh. to stress test the wings. And that's just our new warehouse, right? And so uh, th th there are numerous examples of that. Um, large portions of the space shuttle were made like a block and a half that way, um, which was wild to me. I had no idea that that was the case. I don't know why they made them here rather than in Florida, but <laughs> they were made here. Um, and and so there, there are a lot of people who live here um, who have been here for a long time who are just used to this kind of thing. This is the norm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's I think it's really important to um, spend your time around people who uh, the norm for them is uh, a really high bar. Yeah, right. Um, it it's it's easy to be complacent when you're, when you're living in a small town in Idaho, right? Um, anything that, uh, any hard problem you solve is, is going to feel like it's so different from the problems that the people around you are solving. When you're here in El Segundo, it, uh, the camaraderie and the, uh, just competitive nature of guys being dudes, uh, <laughs> means that, everybody around you solving crazy hard problems means that your crazy hard problem is just another one of them. Yeah. And that's actually a good thing. Um, and, and it, uh, well, it softens your ego for one mm. and it doesn't let you be lazy. Um, and I think that's, that's actually a, a psychologically that's important. Um, so. Dudes just being dudes building nuclear power plants and, and drones and crazy, like well, uh, last five minutes or so, where, where are we headed? Like how far are we until we get to a Jetsons future? Um, do you think we're headed for a Jetsons future? What does that do to society? Hmm. Yeah. So there in general, uh, technology is good and we could, we could talk for a long time about the outliers and, um, the fact that as technology advances, it creates uh, it creates uh, kind of a in in certain subsections of of people um, a kind of dearth of meaning and purpose mm -hmm. um, because if well this is going to sound harsh but if if all of your your purpose and value can be replaced by uh, a piece of technology yeah, interesting that's a really tough spot to be in right and uh, ultimately. Technology is good because it advances humankind's ability to have dominion over the earth. Mm -hmm. This was the creation mandate. Uh, it's right there in the beginning of Genesis. Subdue the earth, have dominion over it. And technology is a lever on that, on that dominion mandate. And so it's good. Um, the questions of what are the downsides and, um, is it is it going to cause problems for society to have flying cars and infinite free energy? Um, yes, but that's because man has fallen, not because technology Ooh. is bad. Um, yeah. Ooh, that's interesting. So. That's really good philosophical territory, maybe for the next one. But uh, man has fallen because that and that's that's the craziest thing about where we are in in the world, and particularly in terms of the secular modernity which is, has so many connections with technology as well, and not only technology, with science, because science basically took a microscope and took a, a scalpel and tried to find God and couldn't find it in the material world, right? Like it, it couldn't, it, 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 it was able to answer all these questions that had traditionally been answered by Christianity or by, 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 by religion, by, by, by the whole thing. And, uh, and then, and then it was found wanting essentially like there, there, there is no, in the material world, there are less examples of divinity. And so you have to kind of trust your imagination or the feeling of faith. I'm, and I'm coming from this, from the non-secular 
belief. I'm I'm not necessarily sure that I am a Christian, although that's where my cultural grammar and everything. But I'm 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 definitely a believer in God. But I don't I don't believe in a in a in a theistic God like a person uh, or anything like that. I believe that God is everything that exists, including and that we are God and that we are examples of God. Um, and but the, I love this point about the the fallen nature because that really does determine somebody's relationship with technology. If they if they if they don't have that inner knowing of God then like then that's it's really hard to live in this world it's really lacking of meaning i would say uh, yeah of course yeah. yeah beautiful yeah. okay uh thank you so much for coming on the show and how can people find out more about you and valor uh well uh mostly on twitter for the time being you can go to valoratomics.com to find our available job postings and a little bit of information but you can also find uh valor atomics at valor atomics on x.com uh, you can find me at Kit Mock on x.com. And uh, it was an absolute pleasure talking with you, Stuart. Thanks for taking the time.